So good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are calling from. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthea Salas, and I am the IC uh, ICA Secretary General, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the DPC ICA uh, webinar. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points, which should be which should help us keep the webinar running smoothly, because we don't have a lot of time, and we got a lot to get through. So, webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be made available after the session. If you have any questions about how the recording will be used, please do get in touch either with us, uh, either at DPC or at ICA, and we'll provide any information that you need. Please, uh, if you could keep your microphones on mute unless you are speaking, and do be aware that we may have to disable the audio for some attendees just so that we can reduce the background noise if required. Please also, if you could turn off your videos uh, to preserve bandwidth as well, that would be greatly appreciated. If you have any questions or comments uh, that come up while another colleague is speaking, please, if you could add them to the chat box or use the raise hand function, which is at the bottom of the participate, uh, participants list. When using the chat box, please ensure that you address uh, any of the comments or chats to everybody so that we, it is visible to the moderators and not just the host. A good portion of the webinar will be dedicated to discussion, so we'd like you all to get involved. Uh, and if, you are, if there are any questions or discussion points that we don't manage to get to during this session, we can forward them to our speakers and we'll follow up after the webinar. Please do note that this webinar will be taking place in English. Uh, we are able to take questions, however, in the chat box in English or French, but if you would like to submit your question in any other language, we will respond to it, but after the webinar. So I'm going to jump right in to the introduction of our different speakers that are joining us here today. So to start off with, we have Margaret Crockett. So Margaret is the ICA's training officer, and she's responsible for face-to-face -face training and, online, and the online learning program for ICA. She's been working within its professional program, and Margaret advises on all aspects of ICA's training and capacity building. She is also a consultant, archivist, and records manager that has been following the developments and advising clients on issues in digital preservation for the last 25 years. We also have joining us today Adrian Brown from the UK Parliamentary Archives and Adrian is the director of the Parliamentary Archives which uh, provides archives and records management service to the UK Parliament. He is an experienced information management professional with expertise in the management of digital and analog collections and is an internationally recognized authority in the field of digital preservation with a proven track record in the successful implementation of practical and operational services in three national cultural memory institutions. He has also authored the award-winning book, Practical Digital Preservation, a how-to guide for any organization of any size. We also have joining us Anna McNally from the University of Westminster. Anna has qualified as an archivist in 2004 and has worked with the university since 2009. Her role is split between encouraging staff and students to use collections and cataloging to make the collections more accessible. She is also currently supervising a trainee as part of the UK National Archives Bridging, Bridging Digital uh, Gap Program. Also joining us today is Angelina Takawira from the UN Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. With a background in management information systems and having worked with the records management and archives management for the UN since 2001, Angeline is now the digital archivist at the Hague branch of the UN's International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. She works on developing policy, procedures, strategy, as well as the implementation and operation of the institution's digital preservation system. And finally joining us, oh, two more people, three more people joining us today, Dorothy Vau uh, from the University of York as a digital preservation archivist for the University of York's Bothwick Institute. Dorothy's work supports long-term access to university digital holdings. She joined the Borthwick Institute in 2019, having worked uh, previously as a digital archivist at Emory University at Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Books Library in Atlanta in the USA. Uh, moderating today will be Sarah Middleton, Head of Advocacy and Communication Engagement for the Digital Preservation Coalition. And also joining us in the background is Jenny uh, Mitchum, who's helping us on the tech side. Uh, she is the Head of Good Practice and Standards at the DPC. So now I'm going to hand over now to Sarah to take us forward into this discussion. 
Uh, thanks, Anthea. Um, and just before we talk to our invited speakers, our panel of digital preservation experts, I thought it might just be useful to introduce what it is that we mean by digital preservation anyway. Um, and I wondered whether it might be useful just to make the comparison with traditional media, because as archivists, I'm sure this will be something that you're very familiar with. So by traditional media, of course, we mean objects which are generally quite robust, they're tangible, we can hold them in our hands, and they're generally independently understandable as long as you speak the language that they're written in. And I think we're quite experienced now in understanding their worth and assigning value to objects like this. Digital information, on the other hand, are, uh, and objects are ephemeral by their very nature, so they're susceptible to obsolescence as they're entirely dependent on the media they're stored on, the accessibility of their file format and often require documentation to use and understand them. Managing issues such as rights can also be much more difficult from protecting copyright to ensuring personal data is protected. They require us to gain new skills to care for them or, to, or for us to work with new groups of colleagues with different skill groups, so IT specialists for example, but they do bring a whole host of new benefits. So these are just some of them and the, some of the reasons why we preserve. So we can achieve legal and regulatory compliance by having a robust demonstrable audit trail. We can increase efficiency by having the right information available in the right place at the right time. There's greater scope for innovation and reuse of data and potentially new, in, uh, new revenue streams. We can improve health and safety and protect the environment through continuous improvement, enabled by access to product or service data, through further research and innovation, and through greater transparency, auditability, and accountability. We can enable further research by making available existing data, and we can document our cultural heritage, providing a complete record. So having reliable access to digital data underpins many of the other priorities, these, some of these priorities an organization might have. So without well-preserved data, none of these things is possible, actually. So we've heard what's, you know, the opportunities, but what is the challenge then? So digital data, images, documents, etc., all have value and create the opportunities that we've, some of which we've just heard about. But this access depends on software, hardware and people. And those technology and people change, creating barriers to reuse. Therefore, we need to actively manage data to protect and create these opportunities. And this is really what we're referring to when we're talking about digital preservation. It's the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. So what does digital preservation need? Well, it needs three things, essentially. Um, organizational infrastructure um, made up of institutional buy-in, for digital preservation to be effective, it needs to be understood across a whole organisation, not just one or two people. And those people, it needs a multidisciplinary team required with skills, including information management, research data management, project change management, software development, user engagement, networking, amongst others. And it needs procedures and processes to underpin the practice. It needs technological infrastructure, by which we mean systems and services, but buying one system off the shelf isn't going to fix digital preservation, unfortunately. Um, to maintain good quality and sustainable digital preservation services, it's important to understand the shifting technological landscape, the options available, workflow management, and the people required to support the processes and systems. And resources, of course, it needs resources, it needs financial resources. And this should be sustainable, targeted and long term funding rather than provided as, as a one off or project basis. And I know that's not always easy, but where possible. Um, it also needs human resources. So organisations must be prepared to invest in capacity, training and development, training and development to create a competent and appropriately skilled and responsive workforce ready to address the challenges of digital preservation. Overarching all of that, it also needs an enabling policy and regulatory environment, which means a broad understanding of the issue across policymakers, regulators, legislators. They need to understand the importance of digital preservation and the potential impact of inaction on all areas of government, society, health, economy, culture, and the supporting legislation to go with it, because the absence of this creates a barrier which people, procedures and processes can't overcome. So just a quick advert, because uh, the DPC actually helps its members to achieve uh, these things through uh, programmes of advocacy, awareness raising, community engagement, 
by providing responses to policy uh, consultations. We provide resources on awareness raising and, and advocacy as well. Training on a broad range of areas within digital preservation, capacity building through targeted support, research and information on the state of the art in digital preservation and access to examples of good practice and information about relevant standards. But how do we do it? So I'm not going to attempt to answer that. I'm going to hand over to the experts for that, um, who are going to tell us a bit more about their experiences, perhaps what made them a bit nervous about embarking on the digital preservation journey before they did, um, and some of the most important things they've learned about digital preservation along the way. So, and all that before we turn to your questions as well. So, um, Margaret, can I ask you just to turn your um, webcam back on? and give a brief introduction a bit about uh, your experiences. Yes, thank you, Sarah, and um, welcome everyone. At the moment, my screen is telling me there are 261 in the room together. This is an amazing turnout, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, to, to kind of give you um, an answer to some of those questions from my perspective, um, I would say that unlike the rest of the panel, I'm a bit different because I'm not a practitioner in digital preservation. I'm more of an advisor and a trainer and somebody who very much keeps um, um, monitoring um, what's going on. Um, I came into it partly because I was just interested and also because I do a lot of current records management and you can't do that without being aware of the challenges of di digital managing digital information and then you then you stumble very quickly upon the issues of preservation and accessibility um, that, that have to do with um, long-term digital preservation. Um, what I would say and it still really makes me most nervous about digital preservation is my technology skills and I use the word technology rather than technical because I, I know I have technical skills. I have technical skills from my archives and records management background, but it's really the, the IT side of things and being able to understand what the issues are from the IT perspective. Um, the most important thing I've learned, I would say, is um, that you have to do, do something to, to preserve digital information, even if you don't think you're gonna be keeping it for very long. Um, I think just leaving it is not an option, burying your head in the sand. But I also think that um, in ICA, we have a, a lot of our members who come from low resource environments, either because they live in parts of the world where um, money is an issue, skills and training in digital preservation are an issue, things like bandwidth can be an issue. Um, but also I work as a consultant with a lot of people in, in the UK who um, their, their organizations are not very wealthy, but you can do, you can take some measures to ensure that when you get the resources that you need for perhaps the ideal fix, your information and your records are ready for that um, longer preservation journey. So things like identifying what it is that you want to keep and ring fencing it in some way is a little step forward, I would say. Wonderful. Thanks, Margaret. I was looking for my unmute button there. <laughs> That's great stuff. Um, we'll move quickly on to Adrian, if we can. Adrian, do you have some, uh, some pearls of wisdom to share? Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's it's wonderful to be here um, and to have so many people from all around the world joining us. It's uh, it's fantastic. Um, and just to say thank you very much to the ICA and the DPC for inviting me to be be part of this today. Um, uh, th those of you who, are, who may be Star Wars fans may may notice I'm I'm joining you from the Jedi Archive, um, which as everyone knows is of course what all all digital archives really look like. Um, I, I'd just like to say a few words about my own. Um, uh, sort of a journey into getting involved in digital preservation. Um, I'd love to say that I had a, a, a master plan uh, which led me to this, um, but in fact, I, I kind of fell into it from, uh, through accident. I, I, I started life as an archaeologist. Um, in times of unemployment, I did some voluntary work uh, at a, a local uh, archive. And so when a, a job was advertised with English Heritage, which is the um, body responsible for the uh, archaeological and built heritage in, in England, um, 
a job was advertised asking for someone with experience of, of archives and, and archaeology. It, it felt like fate. Um, and that led me into my first um, permanent role where I was responsible for uh, looking after the archives produced from archaeological field work. Um, and and uh, archaeologists are, are enthusiastic users of IT. Um, and so I rapidly uh, became interested in the question of how to preserve the digital records which which archaeology was uh, was producing. Now, uh, at this point, this was the sort of uh, late 1990s, I guess, um, at which point digital preservation wasn't really established as a, as a, as a discipline uh, or as a subject um, that one could, for example, study. Um, to any great extent, it was very much a, a, a new area for everyone. Um, and so it was a real sort of step into the unknown uh, for me and, and for others working in the field at the time. So I guess uh, alongside nervousness, I, I, I suppose the overriding um, feeling I had at, at the time was actually of excitement because it, I think what, what fascinated me and drew me to it was the opportunity to get involved in, in a subject uh, which we didn't know the answers to. Uh, we didn't know how to do this and, and, and the opportunity to, to actually really get involved in figuring out how to uh, address some of, these, um, some of these problems and some of these, these fascinating uh, challenges. But I guess the the, the sort of uh, the, the thing that perhaps makes me most nervous uh, throughout my career is is really how do we actually um, address some of these issues in in practice? Uh, how do we make sure that we can um, actually carry out effective digital preservation um, in reality um, within our own organisations? Um, and then uh, finally, just on the on the point of of perhaps the most important thing I've learnt. Um, I, I would say, firstly, uh, well, collaboration, uh, the importance of collaboration. I, I have benefited through the whole of my career by working with a, a huge range of, of, of people, um, sharing ideas and sharing experiences. And uh, one thing I know is that is that we all progress and move forward uh, through that collaboration, certainly not through trying to solve everything on our own. Um, and, and just sort of allied to that, the second um, point I would just make is I think um, that it is really essential to, to keep focused on the, um, if you like, the, the practical challenges and, and, and the practical solutions to, to how, we, uh, how we deliver successful digital preservation. It's very easy, I think, to get drawn into um, theoretical sort of uh, debates uh, about some of the finer points of this and to slightly lose uh, focus from the, the, you know, the realities of how we actually ensure that our our valuable digital resources can be uh, preserved and remain accessible for, for the long term. So I think always trying to focus on the practicalities of what we um, of what we need to do uh, today and and to prepare for the future um, would be my key uh, key message. So thank you all uh, very much, and I look forward to the rest of the session with you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I know some of the questions we've got coming up do focus on some of those more practical and specific questions, so um, perhaps we can talk a bit more about that uh, in just a minute. Um, but first, uh, Anna, are you there? Could you turn your webcam on um, and just say a little bit about your own experiences? Hey, hello, konnichiwa, guten tag. Um, my name's Anna. I'm the senior archivist at the University of Westminster. We've been involved in digital preservation for around about five years. And one thing I would say is that um, when we started talking about this webinar and Sarah described us all as experts, that made me feel very nervous. So I think one of the things you need to sort of understand is that if you're feeling nervous, that's absolutely fine. Even five years into this, we still don't consider ourselves experts. And I'm not sure that I ever will do. Digital preservation is really something that's evolved out of our work with the Institutional Archive. So people just started giving us things in digital form and we really had to deal with them. And that started out, first of all, as a secure server where we could put things on and then moving into external storage and using Archivematica. But for us, really, the focus the whole way through has been on um, sort of access and dissemination and enabling staff to retrieve those files. Because what we found was happening early on was that staff would give things to us. We would put them on a secure server. They weren't able to access them. So they would then keep their own copies and then they would edit those copies and then they would give them back to us again three or four years later. Um, and we found that there were multiple copies of things going around. So we've always really focused very much on the access as much as on the preservation. And that's really been um, sort of one of our strategies. 
for us also, it's very important that we don't just have one member of team, the team working on this. So I'm not a digital archivist and we don't have a digital archivist in our team. We're a team of five, um, but everyone has this as part of their role. So we don't have a single point of failure. And if one person leaves, the rest of the team will still be able to carry on with it. Um, the other thing that sort of, I think I've learned most of all through this is that, as I say, you're, you're not gonna be an expert at the start and you're not gonna feel like an expert five years later. And it, it's very much an iterative process. So we had a very short test phase and we started sort of getting involved with digital preservation really um, sort of early on, we just wanted to get going with things. And it means that some decisions we made then we're now revisiting now, but that's absolutely fine. Um, and just accepting that you're going to learn as you go along. And that's, you know, that's really much, very much part of the process. Wonderful, thanks, Anna. Um, Angeline, are you there? Could you give us a few words about your experience? I am here, thanks, Sarah, and hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this interesting conversation in which I am totally interested, a total geek. Um, as you already heard from Anthea, I worked in records management in the UN for many years and was uh, only appointed digital archivist in the mechanism for criminal tribunals in 2013. Um, and for those who don't know much about the, you know, the background of the mechanism, it was only a year old when I was appointed because this institution was established in 2012 as the successor of the Criminal Tribunal for uh, Rwanda and the Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, and it had the mandate to preserve and provide access to the archives of the tribunals of the two predecessor tribunals. So anyway, there, there I was, digital archivist in the mechanism in 2013, a year old institution. I had quite a lot of theoretical knowledge about digital preservation, but no practical experience, having worked solely in records management. Um, I, I did have and do have some background in um, information systems, so a little bit of technological background there, but I was quite nervous um, coming into this new role and not being sure about how we would know whether we were doing digital preservation right. Um, so it's a new organization, it's a new team and very little experience in the practice of digital preservation, a huge volume of digital archives to be preserved, approximately three petabytes in a wide variety of formats. And where would we start and how would we know that we were not making a mess of things. That was really my personal kind of issue at the time. So anyway, seven years in, that's now, the most important thing that I have learned is that digital preservation is a community effort. It goes back to what Adrian said. There's a huge community with so much opportunity for sharing, benchmarking, validating your processes, procedures, and strategies and decisions. So you don't really have to have it all figured out in order to start. There's a community out there. And also another important thing is that it's not an all or nothing affair. So you don't have to have a Rolls Royce in order to start You know the Rolls Royce of digital preservation. Um, there are levels and depending on your circumstances, your resources and so on, the budgets available to you, you can do digital preservation that is within your budget and fits your circumstances and it will still be good enough. So I would say those are my two key um, lessons at this stage. I know there's a lot more to come. So. Toxic. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. I think and... I'll back to you on some of those. Thanks, Angelina. Uh, and Dorothy, finally, can we, uh, not finally, because we've still got lots more questions to ask, but uh, Dorothy, are you there? Hello. Um, 
Hi, Sarah, and thank you um, for inviting me um, to, to join you all. Um, so um, I will quickly sort of give some background about how I ended up working in digital preservation. Um, first, I'm, I'm really not someone who ever imagined myself working in digital preservation. Um, I was really interested in thinking about the book as an artifact um, when I was studying English literature. Um, and I initially decided that I would enroll in a library science program in order to pursue a career in rare book librarianship. Um, and once I arrived at library school, um, my interests began to shift towards digital archives. Um, I think because I read um, an article about the Salman Rushdie archives at Emory University, and I was really fascinated by um, all of the implications that the acquisition of digital objects um, were having on, upon the way that we um, approach archival work um, and I was particularly interested in the impact of the digital medium upon the creative process and how archivists were kind of working to capture that that trace. Um, so I was lucky enough after graduating from library school um, to get a position at um, the newly formed digital archives unit at Emory University, um, which was really established off the back of the, um, the Salman Rushdie project and um, intended to kind of um, programmatize, if that's a word, um, digital archives at Emory. Um, I was the digital archivist at um, Emory University and I was um, there until last year. Um, and then last year I joined the University of York as their digital preservation um, archivist. And so I've always worked in university settings. Um, I think it's really interesting that universities um, uh, often either have a digital preservation librarian or they have a digital preservation archivist. Um, and I'm always really interested in what leads an institution to choose to have one um, over the other and what, what the implications on a digital preservation program might, might be. Um, throughout my career, I think it's fair to say that I've approached my work in digital preservation very much through the lens of an archivist. I've always been situated within the archives um, and it's as an archivist that I've kind of ended up working in digital preservation. Um, and I think that lots of the principles that underpin archives and thinking about authenticity and integrity and the history of an object and the physicality of an of a object, um, they also underpin digital preservation. So there's some very natural overlap between the two fields and a good deal, I think, that um, they can learn from one another. Sorry, that's my two-year-old in the background. Um, so, um, oh, who I think might be coming to join us. Okay, do you want to? Oh, we can't build a tent right now. He wants to build a tent. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so one of one of the questions that um, we were asked was to talk about um, what made us nervous about digital preservation before we started, um, and it's a it's a tricky question for me to answer because it sort of implies that there was a defined start point that I was aware of, <laughs> um, and I think um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's sort of applied in my case. I think this comes back to what I was saying about um, coming at this as an archivist first and and foremost. Um, I think it was always, I, I always approached this work as an archivist and it was only sort of later that I more sort of formally recognized the work that I was doing as being digital preservation, which probably sounds a little bit silly, um, <laughs> but there we are. Um, and I think digital preservation has always been central to my work as a digital archivist, but it's only since I arrived at York that it's been officially called out in my job title. Um, so I was digital archivist at Emory and now at York I'm the digital preservation archivist. Um, and I had a slightly panicky moment or I've had multiple slightly panicky moments probably um, where the addition of that one word has kind of loomed large for me and sent me down this kind of rabbit hole of trying to untangle the two concepts and worrying that maybe I don't know about digital preservation, I'm just an archivist who does digital things. Um, and so I think occasionally I've fallen prey to this idea that there are these kind of bona fide um, digital preservationists out there who know all the answers and have all the secrets and I'm not one of them. I'm just an archivist who do, does digital preservation work. We'll, we'll do it in a minute. Hang on, darling. Um, so I think... Um, that's that's been something that has made me nervous in the past um is that idea that there are kind of these real digital preservationists out there and i'm not one of them um but i think um 
what I've come to realize is that there's really no such thing as a sort of um, uh, uh, digital preservationist, but rather there's this community of people who engage in digital preservation activity as part of their work. Um, and for some people that might be a very significant part of that work and for some people um, less so. Um, but I think that's that's been a really helpful distinction for me, sort of recognizing digital preservation as a collection of principles and tools and processes that I can select from and incorporate and combine and build upon, um, rather than thinking of digital preservation as this sort of monolithic specialism that you either understand or you don't, or you're either doing or you're, you're not doing. Um, so that's probably um, been one of the, one of the things that I've kind of um, learned, I would say, in my time doing digital preservation. Um, uh, and, and I think um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention was something that um, uh, Jess White and colleagues at the University of, University of Toronto have talked about, um, which is that digital preservation exists on a spectrum. Um, it's not a sort of binary state where you're either preserving something or you're not. Um, and this idea is always at the front of my mind, um, alongside the recognition that our work is constrained by what resources we have available to us and we, we can't preserve everything, we shouldn't preserve everything. Um, I think archivists are really good at recognizing that some loss is inevitable um, and that preservation is all about managing risk and making decisions based on what resources are available um, and then sort of moving up or down this spectrum accordingly. Um, and I think that realization has been really impactful for me um, because I think when I first started out, I would hear this term best practice um, and that was always my goal. Like what, what is best practice and how do we get there? Um, and now I think I really kind of challenge that idea, the idea that there's something there's something that is best practice. Um, when we, which comes back to this idea that digital preservation really doesn't exist as this kind of monolithic approach. Um, it's not something that you either do or you don't, but rather it's kind of a careful balance of resources and risk in order to move that slider to the place where you're doing enough, um, which has always been the big question for me, I think, when I'm thinking about how I should approach a particular set of records or type of data, it's at what point am I doing enough to satisfy what's needed here? We don't need to be doing everything. We don't need to be meeting best practice standards to the letter. We just need to sort of find that place where we're balancing resources and risk and doing enough. Um, so I feel like that was a bit of a ramble. I'm <laughs> sorry, um, but um, uh, and and sorry for the the noisy toddler. Um, but yes, looking forward to to questions. Great, thanks, Dorothy, uh, and to your helper as well. I think one of the reasons we wanted to have this webinar was to kind of um, uh, address that feeling, as you said, that you know you have to be doing all or nothing. You have to be achieving the gold standard, or you're not doing it properly. Um, which is why we invited uh, you all as our speakers, uh, because you represent kind of a, a, a range of different approaches to digital preservation. You've all come at it in different ways. Uh, you've all, but you've all kind of arrived at the same kind of uh, uh, re that realization. Um, I guess is what what I'm saying. Um, so uh, I think now it's it's probably a good time to to turn it over to to you and. Um, the, our attendees to ask some questions. So I'm just going to stop sharing so that we can we can see the faces of our panel. So panel, would you mind just turning your uh, your webcams back on? Um, and we've got well, first of all, I should say that we had 500 people registered for this webinar and over 100 uh, questions pre-submitted. And I, I know that there are already sort of tons kind of scrolling through on the chat box. So um, thank you all very much for, for taking part and participating and, uh, and asking your questions. So maybe a good one to start with um, is from uh, Amaryllis in, um, in Brazil, I, I think, if it's the Amaryllis I'm thinking of, um, who asks about convincing stakeholders to invest in digital preservation. She says it seems impossible. And, and do you have any ideas or um, top tips to, to change that? Uh, I don't know who to ask first. Um, Anna. 
Any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, well, I would say now is probably a really good time because um, I imagine most people on this call are working from home and don't have access to their physical collections. And certainly we found that being able to access our digital archives is obviously very useful, both in terms of um, governance and in terms of teaching. So I think in, you're thinking about kind of disaster planning, um, digital archives, obviously, that's quite a good way of getting around that. For us, um, our archive is in the university buildings in the very centre of London, um, and we were running out of physical space anyway, and it was a lot easier to ask for the money um, to get some more digital storage than it was for a whole new building. So we've tried to equate it to effectively another uh, a strong room and sort of rather than, oh, you know, we're doing something new, this is merely an extension of what we're doing and we need this extra space now. Mm. Good, good, good thoughts. Anybody else? Uh, Adrian, you must have had to, to make the case for digital preservation several times over in your in your career. Um, thanks, Sarah. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would just echo uh, Anna's point. So um, as we've moved into lockdown here, the, the one bit of our operations which has carried on pretty much seamlessly has been um, our digital preservation activities and particularly the task of ingesting records into our digital repository which we've been able to carry on pretty much unaffected so i think i would echo that point that i think um, recent circumstances um, do absolutely um, highlight uh, the, the importance um, but i think more generally i guess risk of sounding slightly obvious i think i think one of the key things is to really understand what your stakeholders really care about and what their particular um, drivers and motivations are because that will vary enormously in different contexts um, so understanding what the people that you have to convince um, usually to, to, to come up with funding um, the kinds of arguments that are most likely to um, to 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 persuade uh, and convince them i think is the key thing and certainly in all of the business cases that i've i've developed it's really be uh, you know, we very much focused on really trying to understand from the wider organizational point of view um, how to tie digital preservation into the you know the wider strategic objectives of the organization um, how to demonstrate the value um, that it brings and the value that it adds and i think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to focus on on the the, the positives as, as well as it you know as well as the sort of the scare stories about losing our data, um, because I think you primarily convince organizations if you can show the value that doing this will bring uh, and the future value that it will bring. So yeah, I think that would be the, the, the most powerful argument. Yeah, um, and actually I should just mention that the DPC members um, collaborated together to produce a, a, a resource that's on the, the DPC website. It's called the Executive Guide to Digital Preservation. And it's des designed to kind of identify those motivators, as you say, Adrian, and, and creates a set of messages that then you can kind of cut and paste if you like, uh, and or tailor them to your own, um, uh, your own situation. Um, but it does, it talks about the opportunities, it talks in kind of a, a positive way about digital preservation, as well as the risks as well, if that's going to be what works for your organisation, because it, it kind of depends. But um, that's that's available and is freely um, open for anybody to use uh, on the DPC website. So thanks, thanks both for your, your thoughts on that. As I said, we've got lots of questions and uh, of those pre-submitted as well, there were lots and lots about making the case for digital preservation. So I think what you've uh, your answers uh, will be helpful to, to lots of people uh, on the webinar today. I'm going to go back to some of uh, the others that we've we've got in the chat box um, and I wondered about uh, this question from Susanti. How to change the culture from conventional to digital archive? When you have a digital archive, should you continue? Should you keep the conventional archive as well? Um, uh, Angeline, is that something that you can talk about? Um, well, maybe not to the same extent that people who have been in the business of managing archives um, um, could talk to. So institutions like Parliament, for example, and universities and national archives have been doing this for years. And um, like I said at the beginning, ours is a fairly new organization established in 2012 and we received 
um, materials that had been produced by the predecessor institutions. But our approach at the moment is to preserve both um, things. Um, so we have a lot of records that were born digital as part of um, the business of the predecessor institutions. And they, is no other way to preserve them except to keep what was produced in its own digital um, state. And whatever was produced um, in the more conventional formats, in paper formats and so on, we also have um, preservation of that going on. And we are not making a decision to replace one with the other. I don't know if that answers, but at least that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good, good perspective. How about you, Dorothy? Is that something you've you've had to think about? Yeah, yes. Um, I think uh, it's a really good question. I think one of the things that um, is always interesting to me is that um, sometimes I think we have a tendency to sort of put digital, um, born digital materials and, and kind of traditional archival materials sort of um, as opposites of each other or, or somehow as kind of in conflict with each, sort of either or. Um, and, and we often hear that term hybrid to describe an archives that includes both. Um, but I always think that, you know, archivists have been managing hybrid collections ever since archives were a thing, we've always been managing different types of formats and thinking about how they sit alongside each other and how we have to um, vary our approaches in order to accommodate the different formats. Um, and so for me, when we're thinking about digital preservation, that's that's just a new a new one, um, but it's something that archivists have been doing for many, for many, many years. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop turning into talking and turning my microphone off. But but yeah, I think I think certainly we should continue to do both and kind of just see the digital as being kind of another another format that we're kind of adding to to, to the list. Yeah, yeah, great. And um, Margaret, I can see you nodding as well. Are there like any particular skills, um, common? Skills, knowledge uh, that archivists need uh, to to face yeah, digital. This is your area of expertise, I believe. Um, I think what we need to remember is that the skills that we already have as archivists and records managers, um, we can draw on and the techniques that we use. So things uh, like appraisal and understanding how no organisations create records and archives and how how they're related to each other are extremely well, important. I'm yeah, um, I mentioned actually, earlier yeah. about the, the technological now. skills that we might need to um, develop in Europe ourselves. Um, so I think it's a combination, but I also think a really important skill is being able to um, right, communicate and moment. relate and build yeah. relationships um, with our IT colleagues. I think that's something that we need to be able to um, speak to them. We need to be able to explain to them what our priorities and what our principles are, and we need to listen to them and hear what their what their challenges are and, and what they're doing. Because I think um, it's very unusual to get a combination of all of the kind of archival skills um, and all of the IT skills in one person. I mean, it, it, it does happen, yeah. but I don't I don't think it's totally necessary. I think it's teamwork and I think it's, you know, the sum of the sum of the individuals is is greater yeah, than I, I think my you know, the individuals added up. I'm not putting this very well, but I think no, no, absolutely. Um, could I just pause a minute and ask uh, people if they're not speaking just to turn their microphones off because we're getting a bit of background noise. Uh, it's a bit difficult to, to hear our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I agree, Margaret. I think it's one of digital preservation is one of those things that you can't do by yourself. It needs sort of either a, a range of skills, well, perhaps in, embodied in one person, but more commonly, it's, it's going to be kind of across a team, isn't it? Um, and uh, you talk about IT particularly, um, and there's a there was a really good guide that we've linked to from the DPC website as well called How to Talk to IT About Digital Preservation or Words to That Effect by Scott Prater, I think. Um, so recommend a, a read of that if, if that's something that, that people uh, are struggling with. So thanks, thank you for that. Um, let's have a look at some more questions. Gosh, there's so many. 
<laughs> um, I have a, a quite a, quite a good question, maybe a commonly occurring question uh, that came in uh, that was pre-submitted by uh, one of the attendees. Um, maybe one for uh, for Anna again. Isn't it just uh, PDFing and saving the PDF? Isn't that what digitalization is? Oh, that's a provocative question. Um, we obviously try and preserve documents as much as possible in the form in which they were created, because that will really impact on how people use them. So for example, if you have an Excel spreadsheet and you preserve that as a PDF, then you're not gonna have the same functionality as part of that document. And it would just be a fundamentally different experience. Um, so you might wanna produce things like PDFs um, as a dissemination tool. Um, but then you really want to make sure that the original type of document is preserved so that all that, you know, that kind of the rich experience and the metadata is, is in there. And then there might be ways in the future where we're able um, to sort of explore those documents in more depth. Um, and sort of some people are using things like digital forensics tools um, to do humanities based research now where they can go into the documents and look at things like edits and revisions. Um, right now, most of the time, we don't allow act people access to the documents in that way, but there may be a safe way of doing that in five, ten years' time. So it's making sure that the same way you wouldn't digitise a paper document and throw away the paper, you, you're making sure that the original um, document type is preserved, even if you're producing a more static one for dissemination. And that answers actually another question that came in uh, about uh, what to do with the original after you have a digitised version. So the approach is the same, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got collections that were digitized um, in the um, sort of early 2000s. Um, and the, 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 all the past lists of the university throughout the 1970s and um, right up to the early 90s, um, and they were all scanned um, and fortunately weren't thrown away because the scans were done in a proprietary format, the company went out of business and now um, for the first few years I was, that I was at the university there was a standalone computer with the software still on it where you could still access the scans, um, but now we're back to having to use the paper versions again. Um, so yeah, always keep the paper. Always keep the original, yeah. Good one. Okay. Um, I wonder if I can ask uh, about authenticity. Um, I had a question about guaranteeing the authenticity of digital archives and what tools and processes are needed. So Angeline, this must be something that's really quite uh, important in your work. Sorry. Is looking for a mute. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's an interesting question and one in which, indeed, um, as a court, it's it's one that we are uh, totally engaged with. And um, authenticity is really ensuring that records are what they purport to be, and it's not only at it's not only something we're thinking about in terms of. Um, in the area of digital preservation, but throughout. So from, um, from creation through uh, use and maintenance and um, storage and transfer between systems and so on, measures have to be in place to guarantee authenticity and integrity of, con of content so that it's trustworthy, so that it's reliable, and it's not only about tools. So it's about procedures, it's about processes. Um, and um, so for example, one of the things that we have um, been very careful about is when records are created, they're created in environments where strict access controls are implemented. So, um, so that there's no accidental or purposeful but unauthorized change um, um, to the records. Um, and when any change is authorized, it must be clearly documented why it's changed, on whose authority and so on, so that there's a complete um, chain of custody or digital, digital provenance for the life of that um, information asset or that record. Um, which keeps that trustworthiness, that reliability um, intact. 
and um, levels, I guess, are also variable. So like, like um, what I alluded to earlier, in a court setting, um, it might also be important to uh, retain a level of experiential authenticity, especially for court, especially for court exhibits, which may need to be reused in another um, in another case. Um, but where those requirements are not there, then you know the the level of then the experiential uh, authenticity might not be a necessary uh, requirement for a different circumstance. So, yeah, it's not just tools. I think tools are just part of it. It's it's processes, it's procedures, it's um, policies um, in place that safeguard the records and ensure that they can be trusted and relied upon. Um, mm -hmm. in the future and for as long as required of this. Yeah, yeah. And Adrian, you must have to think about that as parliamentary archives as well, mustn't you? Sorry, just finding my own read button too. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I I, I think Angelina has, has, has covered comprehensively the, uh, the answer really. I mean, I think the only thing I'd add to that is is that I sometimes think we perhaps get too um, caught up on the issue of authenticity in a digital context and in, in, in seeing it as, as somehow different. Uh, whereas, of course, you know, the, the, the role of archives is is to preserve authentic records um, in all formats. This, this is this is this is what archives do, and, and in a sense, therefore, I think there's a danger that we overthink um, authenticity from a digital perspective um, and forget that you know. We uh, we have the skills and um, uh, and and you know, techniques to, to to manage this um, for uh, records in in all formats. Uh, but but I think um, the, you know, I wouldn't have anything to add really to the, the points that Angelina had made about some of the specific uh, measures that we can that we can take uh, in the digital world. Great stuff. Well, I can't believe it, but we're actually coming up to the to the end of, uh, of our webinar already. Um, but I wanted to ask just a few, I wanted to ask each of you in turn um, for maybe any advice for people who want to enter the field. Do you have like a one one top tip or one piece of advice that you could that you could offer anybody interested in, in working in digital preservation? Uh, I'm going to see if I can find you all on my list now and come to you in turn. Uh, Adrian, I'll come to you first because you're first on my list. Thank you. Um, well, I, I guess my top tip would be, if if you are interested, then then go for it. Um, don't don't be put off by um, you know uh, fears or or, or or being anxious or feeling that you're not you know you're not you're not. Uh, uh, you don't have the the, the skills. You know, uh, I think. Um, so many of us, and myself included, who've, who've come into the role um, have have done so. We, we, you know, we haven't come with some great um, background which has somehow equipped us to, to to do this. You know, we've all, I think, learned along the way, and I think you know, various people have talked about the fact that I think none of us feel like we're we're experts. We're still very much um, learning. Um, but I, you know, I think the most important thing is to is to get stuck in and and and, and try things and don't be afraid. Uh, to make mistakes, um, I've made you know, I've made many mistakes in in my career, as I'm sure everyone has done, um, and that's how we and that's how we learn. So um, yeah, just don't be don't be put off and, and go for it. Super. One of the other questions was, uh, what are the errors? What's the um, some of the errors that you've you've made in in uh, practicing and trying out digital preservation? But that might be a whole other webinar. I think we will have to come to that one uh, as a follow. -up. I think. Um, Margaret, uh, same question to you, but uh, uh, do you have any advice in terms of kind of professional qualifications? Do you need professional qualifications to be a uh, digital archivist? Preservation? Um, so I think um, I would say yes, a professional qualification. Um, one of the ones that um, has a has a really good digital component to it would would be the, the ideal way forward but I also think we've talked about it being a fast changing yes, world yes. I think I mean, you have to be do, willing to continuously to learn and grow in the field and I think my advice would be to make sure that you 
get yourself a network and get you know get linked into the community as everyone who is here today is is obviously doing um and you know read what you can and um just be prepared that it's 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 almost a lifetime commitment really if you want to if you want to carry on in in archives you can't ignore the digital even if you think your future is in medieval manuscripts Good one. Um, thanks. Anna, how about you? What do you think? What's your uh, advice for getting into digital preservation as a career? Um, I think it's just really being being open to it. Um, as you know, I mean, obviously, everyone on this call is has come on because they're interested. But I think there's a remarkable number of people, unfortunately, in the archives profession who have still who are kind of hoping that if they ignore it, it might go away, and it's not going to. So I think there's obviously the the DPC has just done the training course with um, National Archives and obviously know how one. I think that's a really good opportunity for people to to start learning um, and. And yeah, just really kind of go out there and start reading blogs, start following the conversations on Twitter, and you gradually will just just pick things up. You, once you know the kind of basic terminology, it won't seem so terrifying anymore. Super, thank you, um, Dorothy. Do you have a top tip? What's what's the one thing you would would advise people to do to get started in digital preservation? Um, I think, I mean, I would echo everything that everyone's said so far. Um, the, the one thing I might add, maybe, um, is to sort of start out by setting yourself a small goal. Um, I think digital preservation can seem um, really intimidating and like um, there's just so much that you need to get figured out that it's just impossible. Um, but it's a really good idea, I think, to just sort of, and, and something that's always worked for me is to just identify a small goal um, that might be something that you've pulled from um, uh, one of the tools like DPC's RAM, um, or it could be to work with like a, a particular collection that you have um, and just set yourself a small goal of, of completing that one thing and, and, then, and then build on that. Don't try to do everything all at once um, because that can be, that can be really um, disheartening. <laughs> Good on. Um, and Angelina, are there any uh, any resources or um, any uh, to tools, maybe um, open source or uh, free resources that you could point people to that, that might help them get started, particularly thinking about uh, those archives who might have very little um, in the way of resources? Um, yeah, um, and I would like to agree with everything that everyone said about how to start digital preservation. I think it's the barriers to entry are not that high because it seems everybody holds back because they think, wow, we, we just don't have capacity, capability, we don't have money, we don't have all kinds of other barriers that stop progress. Um, but there are resources. So the DPC is an absolute rich source of um, all kinds of content covering a range of areas within the um, uh, digital preservation um, practice uh, practice and theory. And um, there's also a lot of open source tools that are freely available. And one of the things that um, a person can do at a basic level and it is digital preservation is making many copies because it's an approach to preservation multiple copies keep things safe so if you are doing that you are actually doing a component of digital preservation um, but if you want to know a little bit more about your content so what are you keeping instead of just stuff on some storage um, then there are tools like Droid that allow you to know a little bit more about your content. So what formats are there? Are they valid? Are they properly formed and so on? And then you get deeper into, into the practice of digital preservation and, and, it, and it progresses that way. So um, yeah, the DPC website is my one recommendation for a range of materials and um, get started with tools such as Droid, which are freely and openly available. And, you know, baby steps. And before you know it, it's, it's, it becomes part of what you are able to do and can speak to. Super. 
Uh, thanks, Angeline. That's that's really great. Some really good good tips from you all there. Um, so, as I said, we've had just hundreds of, of questions, and they've been pouring in as we've been talking and listening to our uh, our panel as well. So, I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to answer them all. Uh, and I think what we'll do is. Um, I'll circulate the rest of the questions to the panel and we'll see if we can put together a follow up blog post with some questions and answers and, and pointers to some other resources as well. But um, I just want to say a huge thank you to, uh, to Adrian, to Angeline, to Margaret, to Anna, to Dorothy um, and to Anthea for inviting us to have this, this webinar with you today. So Anthea, thanks back to you. Well, thank you very much for to the DPC for agreeing to co-host with us. I think it's been a great webinar and I think we've had some really interesting conversations and many more uh, moving forward. But I would like to thank uh, everybody for attending today. Uh, for information, uh, the webinar will, the recording of the webinar will be shared by the DPC and the ICA uh, at the latest by the end of this week, but hopefully by tomorrow. Please do also read the blog posts we've posted throughout the day today on various topics uh, within and around digital preservation. So that's available on the ICA blog. If you would like to find out more about the DPC, do visit their website at www.dpconline.org. Also, if you want to hear or learn more about ICA, please go to our website, www.ica.org. You can follow both the organizations on Twitter. So DPC is at DPC underscore chat and ICA is at IC archive. <laughs> so you can just look us up. I'm sure you'll be able to find us on Twitter. Uh, and you can email either Sarah, whose email is up there now, uh, or you can also email us at ICA at ICA.org. So thank you again to our speakers, to DPC, and to everybody who joined us here today. And we will see you next time. Have a great day, night, and or afternoon. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.